Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Sarah Entz, and I'm the Promotions and Publicity Coordinator at the University of Manitoba Press. To everyone who is joining us here on Zoom and everyone joining us on Facebook Live, welcome to the virtual launch of Grasslands Grown, creating place on the US Northern Plains and Canadian Prairies. <laughs> Tonight, we'll be joined by author Molly P. Rosam and special guests Sheila McManus and Royden Lowen. I'd like to acknowledge first that the University of Manitoba Press is located on the original lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. U of M Press respects the treaties that were made on these territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to moving forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. I'm going to share a 30% off code in the chat, which you can use if you buy Grasslands Grown directly from the U of M Press website. If you'd like to purchase the book, but don't want to do it through our website, we urge you to support independent bookstores. Uh, for example, McNally Robinson Booksellers in Winnipeg and Saskatoon is a great example. They do a lot for their local writers and they ship across Canada. So um, I've got the discount discount code here and I'll just pop it into the chat. We will be ending this evening with an audience Q&A. So if you have questions about the book or questions for any of our guests, you will have an opportunity to have them answered. Feel free to type your questions into the chat or the question and answer box at the bottom of your screen at any time throughout the event, and I will pose them to our panelists during the Q&A. Please also feel free to send me a message through the chat if you have any Zoom-related questions or difficulties. It is now my pleasure to introduce tonight's speakers. First and foremost, I am thrilled to introduce the author of Grasslands Grown, Molly P. Rotham. Molly is co-editor with Lori Ann Lalum of Equality at the Ballot Box, Votes for Women on the Northern Great Plains. The collection includes Rosam's article, Citizenship, Civilization, and Property, the 1890 South Dakota Vote on Women's Suffrage and Indian Suffrage. The new collection, The Greater Plains, Rethinking a Region's Environmental Histories, edited by Brian Frenner and Kathleen A. Brosnan, published by University of Nebraska Press, includes Rosam's article, Nature rarely establishes sharp boundaries. Settler society, agricultural adaptation in the Great Plains Northwest. Rosam is associate professor and Ronald R. Nelson chair of Great Plains and South Dakota history at the University of South Dakota. Rosam earned a BA in American studies from the University of Notre Dame and an MA in American folklore and PhD in US history from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Rosam grew up in Mitchell, South Dakota. Next, our first guest of the evening is Sheila McManus. Sheila is a professor of history at the University of Lethbridge. She is the author of The Line Which Separates, Race, Gender, and the Making of the Alberta-Montana Borderlands, Choices and Chances, A History of Women in the U.S. West, and Both Sides Now, Writing the Edges of the North American West, which is forthcoming in 2022. She's also the co-editor of One Step Over the Line, Toward a History of Women in North American West and The Line Crossed Us, New Directions in Critical Border Studies. Our second guest of the evening is Royden Lowen. Royden is a senior scholar and former chair in Mennonite Studies at the University of Winnipeg. He serves on a number of Mennonite history and organic agriculture boards and a series editor of the Ethnicity and Culture History series at the University of Manitoba Press. His books focus on social and environmental histories, mostly within Mennonite contexts, and his most recent book, which launched earlier this month, is called Mennonite Farmers, A Global History of Place and Sustainability, published by the University of Manitoba Press. Roy and his son Sasha operate Millview Grain, a certified organic farm near Steinbeck, Manitoba. I will now happily invite Molly to offer a brief presentation.
Thank you very much, Sarah, for that introduction and Roy and Sheila for helping me to launch this book. I really appreciate it. And for all of you out there who have chosen to spend a little bit of your evening with us. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna sh share some slides here for a few minutes. There, I think you should all be able to see uh, this sort of old map. It's from a National Geographic um, magazine in 1983, but I just sort of like the map because it shows us historically the extent of North America's grasslands. And I sort of, this project studies from South Dakota on North and West, what I call the Northern grasslands. Um, <clears throat> and this map sort of shows you the historic extent in the lighter green and then the darker green is an existing prairie, although compromised by various other activities. And then some of the boxes and triangles and squares show you different plots of prairie that are either preserved by federal organizations, state or provincial governments, or the Nature Conservancy in some cases. Uh, the bright blue star is where I am speaking to you from in Vermilion, South Dakota located on the Missouri River. And I want to acknowledge that I live on the original lands, homelands of the Dakota, Nakota, and Lakota nations, and near the historic Earth Lodge villages uh, sites in, uh, of the Arikara and Mandan nations located on the Missouri River within the state of South Dakota and on up into North Dakota. And my book explores the intersection and cultural geographic concepts of sense of place and regional identity as they intersect with the theory of settler colonialism. Indeed, I argue that the growth of sense of place and the formation of regions defined in part by nation states from the advent of settler society down the generations to the middle of the 20th century are important parts of the settler colonial process that must be understood in order for settler society to move forward in um, the future in partnership with indigenous peoples and the spirit of reconciliation mentioned by Sarah Enns in her introduction. So I want to tell you just a little bit about the book before I invite um, both Professor Lowen and Professor McManus to offer some of their own comments on the book. Um, I analyze a group of people who uh, were either carried to the northern grasslands on both sides of the border between Canada and the US as children or who were born there in North Dakota, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, South Dakota, Alberta, and Montana. And they were born in the late 19th century and lived to about the middle of the 20th century, sometimes a couple of decades later. And I examine their experiences as children with landscapes and their thinking about the land and the, and the environment as adults. With a few exceptions, the people that I study were not really important national figures. They achieved prominence in state circles um, or provincial circles, regional circles, and maybe in their chosen professions or ethnic groups. While their settler colonial parents claimed the land through federal processes, the grasslands grown generations of settler society, this group of people I'm talking about, processed and shifted experiences with the land and atmosphere into cultural products, novels, paintings, poetry, new crops, new animals, and new landmarks and parks. These products aimed to imprint settler society's interpretations of the environment and space on the continent. And so part of the project involves exploring sense of place, how they dug into the ground, how they're, they related emotionally and um, sensually, physically with the land, how they got to know the place. And a few of the people, I just wanna show you some of their pictures uh, uh, that I study. Some of the pictures will be in the book, other, others won't. Uh, one of the women I study is Anora Brown. She's in the middle of the photograph and the center of this slide and uh, around it are various 
um, illustrations and paintings of hers. She grew up in Fort McLeod, Alberta, and lived near the Blood and Pygon um, re Reserves. And she was trained at the Ontario School of Art in Toronto, and she became known for her regional painting. She also wrote a book called Old Man's Garden, um, which she appropriated um, as, a, as a black uh, foot figure. And she basically uses, you know, discussion, discusses the names and the plants of the prairies. And in it can be seen conflicts that her generation felt about how to make sense of this place, a place that they love and at the same time are, are plowing under, whether or not she did it personally. Another person that I study is Robert McAlman, who grew up in Eastern South Dakota um, and is not really well known as a writer. He uh, worked in particular with space and atmosphere and its effects on perception. And he tried to get this, these ideas into modern literature. And he was part of an expatriate crowd in Paris um, in the 20s but used his own experiences growing up in Eastern South Dakota and a little bit in Minneapolis to, um, as his source material. Here you see him pictured with Ernest Hemingway and some of the other friends in a cafe in Paris. And he ran a uh, publishing company called Contact and was actually the first publisher to, um, um, to uh, publish uh, Ernest Hemingway's first book. Long story there. <laughs> um, these two women, Laura Goodman Salverson, a Manitoba writer, and Thurstina Jackson Walters from North Dakota, grew up in Icelandic communities that transcended the border. Um, Salverson was born in Winnipeg, and Walters was born in North Dakota. And they both, um, Salverson, of course, wrote. Uh, novels. One of the ones I focus on is The Viking Heart, published in 1926, and, and also her autobiography, Confessions of an Immigrant's Daughter. And Thorstina Jackson Walters wrote A History of Icelanders in North Dakota. And she argued, um, in particular, both of them kind of looked at whiteness and argued that their uh, they were good immigrants, that they would contribute to North American society at this time in the early 20th century when racial hierarchies were surrounding them. Arabelle Thompson grew up in, on a rented farm and in Mandan in Bismarck, North Dakota. She left a 1946 memoir, and, um, which is very important for uh, understanding race relations of the time. And for the Northern grasslands, I think to bring in racialized ethnic minorities of the time, and of course, indigenous people. So she offers a very interesting perspective. At the same time, she talks about the environment and her experiences growing up. Um, one person who um, grew up in Winnipeg and Battleford, Epi Laurie Storer, um, I present a range of attitudes and ideas from people. And, Effie Storer was one of the least successful in changing her, her ideas over time. Um, she believed in the superiority of her civilization and sort of never changed her mind about these things. And I think it's one of the things I try to do is present a variety of people who come at a variety of different um, perspectives so that we can understand the range of responses um, from settlers and how they dealt with their changing environment and how they dealt with indigenous peoples who remained in the same space. Um, she tried to write her memoirs and was never successful. Um, I like this picture because it really um, connotes the sense of place that I argue this generation grew um, with the uh, um, stooks or shocks, as Americans like to call the sheaves or bundles of wheat in the field there next to grasslands, um, unplowed and the river and trees. Those are all elements that formed part of this generation's sense of place. Um, for them, grasslands, native habitat and agricultural fields became one and the same um, in a standard settler society remix of nature and culture. 
um, by the 20th century, the middle of the 20th century, this generation referred to prairies and plains without regard often to the amount or even the presence of native grasslands habitat within their total mix. Still, key to their sense of place is their actual physical experience with native grasslands habitat, habitat experiences that would not be available for subsequent generations. This is sort of a pre-World War II sense of place um, before what historians, agricultural historians call the great disjuncture after World War II. Uh, one woman who gives me a lot of insight into agriculture is Elsie May Hammond, who grew up in Saskatchewan near Maple Creek. She, um, she was the last to leave her family ranch farm. Her parents were the kind of homesteaders and she had two sisters and three brothers, but she stayed there until she retired to town. Um, fabulously, she kept a 40, 50 year diary where she wrote in it every day. It's not a reflective diary, although occasional insights creep in, um, but she helped me to understand some of the agricultural changes. George Will from North Dakota was born into an 1880s seed supply store. And he studied archeology span and led one of the first excavations of a Mandan earth lodge along the Missouri River. Um, here he stands in a field of Mandan yellow soft corn. And he wrote two books, Corn Among the Indians and Corn for the Northwest to convince settler society farmers that indigenous corn varieties could play a large role in diversified farming. And he worked very closely with um, Jim Holding Eagle here pictured and his mother scattered corn um, who taught him about the traditional ways uh, natives grew corn. Oops. Um, oops, I think I skipped one. Okay, here's a Walter Prescott Webb um, map of prairies and plains. And he was a very famous uh, his, historian. He used a lot of geography and came from his book called The Great Plains of 1931. Some of the people I read studied Webb and contemplated his maps and ideas. Um, it suggests um, to look at the regions, another part of this project is to say how regions formed and developed over time. The book suggests that this process unfolded over their lifetimes and it took them a lifetime to come to terms with the space and its, envir and its environment. And the struggle itself shifted regional identities. The parents of settler societies grasslands grown migrated to a region they thought of as the West or the Northwest in both Canada and the United States. By the end of their lives, the next generation lived in the Prairie Provinces and the Great Plains states, and eventually some in the Eastern region, reaches of the grasslands lived in the Middle West, a region which appeared occasionally, but not securely above the 49th parallel. Um, it was periods of cyclical drought in combination with modern farming that caused them to change their ideas about regions. Nationalism in part explains the eventual dominance of the Prairie and Plains labels respectively above and below the 49th parallel. Um, but generally during the period I study, there's a lot of exchange across the border and I find this generation preoccupied with securing settler society rather than distinguishing themselves. In other words, they share a lot because they share a similar landscape. Uh, one of the one person who gave a lot of attention to this changing notion of region is Wallace Stegner, who lived in both Canada and the United States. Um, and he wrote several novels. And in studying his work, you can see that he changed his idea of where aridity started in the region how it came to play um, and spent a lifetime doing it and wrote some lovely novels. Um, a Canadian counterpart might be Wilfred Eagleston, a journalist um, who aspired to be somewhat like Stegner, but really wrote what I would consider a bunch of uh, boys novels um, and also some memoirs about his life on the range. He also is from Alberta. Now I, I look, I kind of end with this last 
uh, second to last map here to talk about this transnationalism. It's interesting to me, I researched these individuals separately and I went from archive to archive from you know, the provincial ones to the state ones to historical society archives to local regional archives and studied them one by one. But what I found is they were all in contact with one another. I began to see that individuals showed up in each other's collections. They corresponded. They attended the same regional and national events. And they read, reviewed, and drew from each other's works, whether scientific or creative. These connections happened across state and provincial boundaries, as well as within the two nations. So I found that to be very interesting. And I want to end with one final map. And this shows you modern uh, indigenous reservations and reserves. And um, I just wanted to point out that in the Northern Plains, of course, indigenous peoples remained in the region and were building their own lives at the same times. And they very much contested much of settler society's claims, cultural claims to this space. Um, knowledge of the Northern grasslands environments remained important sources of indigenous power. Indigenous national senses of place and place involving landmarks of sacred and historic spaces persisted despite the goals of settler society. Um, more over the same time period, indigenous nations made reserves, reservations, and additional cultural sites in the spaces of the modern, into the spaces of modern sovereignty that we know today. And so with that, I've said a lot, showed you some nice pictures. I'm going to invite um, my guests to offer some initial comments. Thank you so much for that presentation, Molly. I really appreciate it. And it's always nice to get a, a, a recap before we have to dive in. Um, so first thing I want to say, congratulations on the book. Um, I was so thrilled to get my copy in the mail and, and to finally get to start reading it. Um, I'm going to keep my comments very short so that we have lots of time for questions and conversations. So I right now I'm just going to comment on the three features of the book that I loved the most. So first was that sense of place. I grew up here in Southern Alberta. Um, I work here in Siksikai Satapi territory, which is the heart of the Blackfoot Confederacy. So your author's descriptions of the land and the mud and the wind and the grasses just resonated so powerfully with me. Um, and you write so beautifully that I don't know how someone who doesn't know these places, this particular ecosystem reads those descriptions, but I feel like with your writing, you've given them their best shot at understanding this place um, and these kinds of areas. Um, secondly, those these rich histories that you've pulled out of these children who will go up, grow up to become interconnected adults, but you take seriously, you do see this place um, through their eyes as children and then again in their adult writings as well. Um, and I like that you included their experiences with animals and the land, like horses and mud. Um, to show how those relationships also shaped how these children saw and experienced the land around them and how in many ways, you know, a, a pony um, was kind of like a gateway into understanding this space and then moving through it in a very specific kind of way and capturing that transition from riding on the back of a horse to more modern forms of transportation. I thought that bit was just lovely. I think that piece of the book, you're literally showing us the growth of settler colonialism and how settlers come to convince ourselves that this is our home too. Um, so I think you've, you've actually filled an enormous gap in how we think about settler colonialism. So third and finally, that wonderful chapter about labels. So I'm a borderlands historian, so I get a little obsessed with how settler colonial states um, impose themselves on a place and how they come to naturalize their presence and their mental maps. So that final chapter was just incredibly um, exciting to me um, that, that you could kind of track how the contemporary labels shake themselves out, you know, from like shared labels for a shared ecosystem, how and why and when they become separate labels for what is supposed to be a bifurcated two nations kind of region. Um, so I, I will stop there um, and hand it over now to my colleague, Roy Lowen. Thank you. And uh, 
Yeah, yeah. first of all, yeah, warm congratulations, Molly, on a on a lovely book. Um, and I uh, coming after Sheila, I'm gonna <laughs> I, I echo everything Sheila said, and now I've got to find a couple more things to say. Uh, but I think I want to just you know um, accentuate uh, that what you've done is you've added this cultural component to what we know about illegality uh, and injustice. We know about you know John Weaver's great land rush. We know the we know the the uh, the tactical uh, you know, legal apparatus by which Indigenous peoples were dispossessed of their lands, but how do settlers begin to imagine that they have a legitimate place here and that this is normal? Um, <clears throat> and you've done that, uh, I think, very um, subtly. I mean, you, you don't write with a heavy hand. You you invite us into this into this narrative, and as Sheila said, you know, with uh, and through the lenses of children. And I think this is the other thing about your book is that you have, uh, and I might ask a question with that too, is that you do so much more than you actually claim to do. I think, I mean, you, you, you bring children into the mainstream of a uh, historical discourse. And, you know, this is the great sort of, un, you know, forgotten demographic, right? Children are socialized into uh, thinking and behaving in a particular way, which undergirds how societies evolve. Um, so I, I love that, and and as she just, I love that tactile sort of sensuous uh, uh, history that we have here because you you come away smelling and feeling and touching a lot. Um, I like the way you uh, problematize the way uh, uh, writers talk about the prairies. I was really engaged in this uh, this sort of uh, dialectic between dullness and the wild. As, uh, as writers from this region try to convince their more sophisticated Easterner writers that they also have something to contribute to, you know, fantasy debates and about uh, middle-class banality. So we're here too, and, and the grasslands matter. Um, thirdly, I thought you, uh, I don't know, see, you, you, I, I, I want to ask a sort of a critical question at some point, she, or, or, or uh, Molly, about you talk about unconscious. Are these guys doing this unconsciously? Did you unconsciously pun on groan here? <laughs> Are the grasslands groaning <laughs> as this occurs? Uh, and nice, and, nice. <laughs> <laughs> and I felt like there was a there was a you know a kind of a, a empathetic groan with you know the the indigenous peoples who are. Uh, and, and, and again, I, I really thought this was very insightful. It's not that settlers don't care about indigenous people. They don't know any indigenous people, right? Because the indigenous people live on reservations slash reserves. Um, and I, I, I really was drawn into that sort of epiphany almost. And then fourthly, and finally, um, what you do is, um, and again, I think you're, you're, you're contributing to st studies in nationalism. I know, and you know, the book's long enough, Molly, but if you had had more room uh, or, you know, the, the idea that Canadian nationalism and American nationalism rise after the initial settlement period and, and that this is part of the way you begin re your cosmology by which you think of settler society as normative, but that you have, it's not only uh, Canada and the United States, but but uh, and they're and, and absolutely fascinating. I and mean, comparative history is always interesting. Uh, you know, in the sense you have you have railroads, we have we have we have um, uh, homestead laws, etc. But we also have evolving nationalisms that uh, link the grasslands to oftentimes eastern uh, capitals. Uh, yeah, in both cases eastern capitals. Um, but that that evolving identity. Uh, Benedict Anderson calls an imagined a village that this or community that this is part and parcel of the bigger question of uh, of a cultural um, invention that occurs in the in the grassland. So I, I love those other themes that you uh, weave into the book almost seamlessly. 
and and um, and and themes that that want you to ask more questions and and think in, in bigger ways. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so yeah, so I've I've got questions, but Molly, do you want to just a chance to kind of respond first before we pepper you with more of our questions? I'm I'm ready for questions, but okay. just just want to say thank you all for 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 those uh, insights in, into the book. I'm sure. So I want to start. I get to go first again, um, and it's kind of a methodological, historiographical question. I was reminded again when I was reading this that when you started the research for this book really the history of children and youth didn't exist as a field yet you know it's coming out now and now you know that field i think you know has taken off a colleague in in my department um specialized in that so i was really struck by that piece like the environmental history feel of this was maybe a bit more established but when you started this you would not really have had a whole lot of historiographical support to draw from so how did you proceed I think this is kind of the combination of where did this idea come from question, but then also how did you begin working when really, you know, kind of in the earlier years of this research, nobody else was asking questions that took children seriously. Well, uh, you know, um, one historian in the field of the American West that I've always appreciated is the work of Elliot West. And do you remember that study he published called Growing Up With the Country? And it had, some discussion of children. And then also, I happened to find some wonderful uh, sources early on those Humphrey and Pickler family papers that had saved all the children's letters, you know, when they're talking about animals and such. I ran into really good children's sources that I wanted to, to use. And so there was a bit out there, but so it's a combination. And I was fascinated by that idea of growing up with the country. And now whether I would have focused completely on childhood, I don't know, mm -hmm. but that idea that there's a difference there between those generations growing up in the place they didn't intend, they didn't move there. <laughs> they didn't consciously move there. They were taken there by their parents. Their parents had a vision of what they thought they were doing. And then these kids are there and how do they come to terms with the place? What did they do? And so I sort of naturally started by thinking generational as mm. much as children. Mm -hmm. And so when you're thinking generational, children become a part of it. Okay. If that makes sense to you. Yeah, no, no, it absolutely does. Um, so this is partly what the original question has started out as, but then you stumbled across richer sources from children than you were expecting and that gave it a clearer focus. That I could actually write in, um, you know, and think about the way children thought, right? Yeah. And then some of them memoirs where they kind of, um, you know, will reflect back and you can, you know, they're not quite living the, you know, remembering even exactly what they thought as children, but there's been some theory about that too. So they just have these little mm -hmm. snippets and pieces of things going on. And so um, it was a combination of things that allowed me to, to write about them. Yeah, I thought that was so, like, what a great collection of sources that, you know, with some of your authors, you, you can literally track, you have writings from them as children, or at least as younger people, and mm -hmm. then writings as mature adult with that reflection of memory, or the point that Roy had raised, they're deliberately trying to make a point about my place matters too. Yeah. Um, yeah so I thought yeah. it was just fascinating that yeah, you've got yeah. this group of people who you can actually track their thinking. It's not just a single snapshot or a single novel or, or memoir written by an adult that you're able to actually track, you know, kind of the growth, literally, again, I apologize for the pun, um, <laughs> of, of, this, of this particular group. Um, yeah, so again, I'll, I'll stop there um, and hand it back to Roy. Mm, thanks, Sheila. Um, I'm not sure exactly how to, uh, maybe, maybe I'll continue along this historiographical line, uh, Molly. So, so you are in a particular sort of generation. I was just wondering whether, so we have a lens now, uh, settler indigenous relations is, is, is the lens that preoccupies us, part because, you know, this has now become a, um, finally a burning political issue for us. But I'm wondering whether you gave thought to, if you had written this book, you know, 50 years earlier or 25 years earlier, whether, I mean, I can imagine that 
that you could you could ask you could take these same sources and you could focus on gender, for example, masculinity and femininity, or you could have like in the seventies and eighties, like the the idea of ethnicity, right? This was you know that we were all uh, lampooning the American frontier idea and the melting pot and all that, and and looking for cultural maintenance and persistence. Um, and imagine earlier in the thirties and forties, you know, some, uh, some, L, uh, some fun, uh, you know, foundational environmental analysis and then earlier nation building. Like, are you like, were you self-conscious about when you were writing this book that you were in a particular generation asking a particular set of questions, um, uh, through a certain lens and that you were asking your sources to speak to that issue when in fact, maybe sometimes you had a sort of, as I mentioned earlier, you had to speculate about unconscious motivations and, uh, mm -hmm. and, and so on. You want to talk about that a bit? Yeah, um, I, I'm, I think I'm following what you're asking, but um, well, first of all, I feel like I've worked on this book a long time. <laughs> so, you know, I, I've immersed myself in the sources and my questions have grown and, and changed. Um, I, uh, um, I was very interested in, you know, relationship, you know, how settler society formed down the generations. I was very interested in the kind of 90s questions about you know, where the West started. I felt like people just took those lines and said, that's it. And, you know, 98th Meridian, 100th Meridian, and people didn't really ask the sources what region they lived in. But then as I started to, you know, hone the project, I became more interested in, you know, well, how are settlers making sense of, you know, indigenous history, indigenous people in their societies. I mean, one of the things that's really interesting about the Northern Plains is people persisted and they actually, despite all the land loss, hung on to certain, like there's nine reservations in South Dakota, for example, large reservations. Of course, we do reservations differently in the US than the Canadian reserve system. But um, I sort of combined some of those kind of 80s and 90s questions with then emerging settler colonialism. And I was, um, I really wanted to get into people's thinking about race relations and about um, how they were making sense of Native American presence. Because I feel like for settler colonials down the generations, their tendency is to just ignore. Or, you know, so, and I feel like we don't discuss enough the mixed motives or ideas that these people had and trying to understand, most of them are flawed, right? Some of them have some insight that are, you know, that we like to um, follow. Uh, and in handling all of the threads, I mean, there are many threads I would have liked to include other chapters like on ethnicity or on, but I'm not sure that, um, you know, I was really trying to keep it down, you know, it is big enough you know, in that way. I'm not sure if I answered your question entirely. So if you have a follow-up there. Um. No, no, I think just to, just to affirm what you've, uh, you've, you've done here and just to observe how the whole historiographical field of, you know, grassland studies itself is evolving from, you know, one, one decade to, to, to the next. I just know that when, you know, when I began my doctoral studies, it, it, you know, it was like, and I, my, 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 my doctorate was also a comparative study of, of Manitoba and Nebraska uh, communities. And it like indigeneity wasn't part of that mix at all. It, uh, we were talking about, you know, ethnic variables and uh, it was, it, we were, we were bashing something else in those days. And um, I, no, I just, I'm, I, I, I think you've done, just remarkable service here uh, by how you, um, again, as mentioned in my opening comments, you, you do this subtly and um, you, you invite people into uh, these life worlds um, without, without sort of hammering away at, um, you know, at, I, think, I think you show rather than tell. Uh, and, and so that's just, uh, uh, yeah, a note of congratulations on that. 
Well, and, you know, and I tried to walk that line about, in, you know, interpreting indigenous experience that I really am looking through the settler colonial eyes that have some indigenous voices, right? And I'm, you know, when they were able to form relationships, but trying to say, you know, trying to look at how settler society, some of them are changing their eyes, their minds, some of them aren't, right? And that's, you know, that's a uh, interesting ground to walk. I didn't want to claim to speak for people that I didn't study, um, but I wanted to actually make it a part of the discussion too. So I really appreciate those comments that you 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 noticed that that sort of effort, you know, that I wanted to contribute to that without kind of stepping over some boundaries that maybe I'm not as um, informed on, you know? Yeah. Okay, Sheila. <laughs> I, I don't want to take up all the time. I know Sarah had had a question and then I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that members of the audience oh, have questions see. as well. So, right. um, you know, don't, don't let me keep going. But I think just as a follow-up, I was thinking about Roy's comment about generationally, right? So Molly, if you and I, you know, are kind of the same generation, and if I may, Roy, perhaps representing a, a, an elder generation um, <laughs> from ourselves. Um, but, and I think, yeah, I just want to sort of um, echo um, the point that Roy had just made, you know, you've worked on this for a long time. Um, and, you know, I admire your ability to write like big, gorgeous, beautifully written books. Um, I can't seem to write a big book to save my life. Um, and I envy those of you who can do it and do it well, like from start to finish, it's gorgeously written. I seem to peter out, you know, in a hurry. But, it, but it, the point that I'm trying to make here is that it doesn't feel like a project that you've been working on for a long time. It feels so up to the minute in terms of both that kind of historiographical, you know, the, the, the historiographical moments that we historians find ourselves in, that critical apparatus, right? Bringing that, I think very, yes, gentle, but still very sophisticated perception of settler colonialism. It was a bit that I liked. You know, I had a moment early on of thinking, oh, you know, like what if that piece isn't here? And it's here, <laughs> and it's, but it's here through the eyes of children, right? And I thought that was just so, as I mentioned earlier, for me, that's just one of the really remarkable achievements of it. That part is taken seriously because I do think that gives us a very different and new and fresh perspective on settler colonialism through the eyes of children, right? And these race relations, children can't ignore other people the way adults can. You know, children can't ignore that they live right next door to these communities, right? Adults you look at sources from adult settlers and they're perfectly happy to ignore, like I've done that work, right? They're perfectly happy to ignore that they live right next door to indigenous communities and children don't have that barrier. Um, so I'm starting to repeat myself now, but it was again, very much one of the pieces that I liked a lot. Sarah, save me from babbling. <laughs> Thank you so much for that, um, that conversation. Um, I will jump in to open the floor to audience questions. Um, you can feel free to type um, into the chat box at the bottom or the Q&A box at the bottom. Um, also, you can push the raise your hand mm -hmm. or raise hand button. Um, and then I will unmute you uh, if you'd like to uh, speak your question aloud to Molly or to Sheila or Roy. Um, and uh, while we're sort of waiting for, for some of those questions, maybe I will um, ask the question I had for, for Molly. And, um, and if there's time, you know, I'm sure people would also love to hear more questions from Sheila and Roy as well. So, um, but yes, I do. I did want to sort of welcome, now is the time to ask your burning questions. Um, my own, my own question um, that I was really curious about is Molly, how did you go about the process of weaving together so many different voices that you draw from literary texts and art and archives? And, and what was that process like choosing who to include and how to include them all together? Okay, yeah, there, there's kind of several parts to that question, but, uh, and some of it's sort of simple and some of it's, it's, it's more difficult. The one thing <clears throat> that I tried to do with everybody I discussed, I was trying to ask questions about their relationship to the land and place and regional identity, things that had to do with the land. If you were to use these people for other subjects, they would come out differently because I'm only talking about their relationship to the land and, and ways they get to that relationship. 
Um, but more than that, one of the things that oh, I realized over time, and it's actually part of the settler colonial process, but you know, I went around, I don't know how long I spent, probably more than a year on the road. I went around from you know, the South Dakota Historical Society in Pier to, <clears throat> to you know, the North Dakota Institute for Regional Studies and Bismarck and you know, University of Manitoba and Manitoba Archives, Saskatchewan Archives. I spent all this time on the road going and I went in and some of the ways I looked for people um, <clears throat> was by their age, um, age of birth or their, their year of birth, right? I tried to pick out a certain group of people and I, because obviously these things are collected and a lot of times they're collected in the pioneer father's family, you know? And so I would look in that finding aid and see do the kids have any documents? Did they leave any diaries? You know, I would go in that old fashioned way and look for those things. But, you know, in the end, I realized that in some ways the people I included were all collected by these institutions that are also part of settler colonial society, right? These are archives set up to collect people that they felt were important, right? And like, for example, the South Dakota Historical Society was founded, you know, as the Old Settlers Association, you know, in um, the Sask Saskatchewan Archives Board was founded in 1945, the North Dakota Institute for Regional in 1950. Um, <clears throat> George Will was president, you know, one of the characters I study was president of the North Dakota Historical Society for many, many years. The um, Glenbow Institute in Calgary is founded in 1955. I found all of a sudden all of these institutions, right? And so they had collected a certain group of people. And I think these people wanted whoever was collecting and the people who got their collections to these institutions, they wanted their story told, right? So it's a, these institutions are part of that process, I think. And so um, you know, that's part of the story and then weaving them together. And I always say this, you know, I had, it was hard to um, get my children to grow up. Um, <laughs> I found writing those earlier chapters where they're all kids and they did the similar things, you know, on the homestead or in the small towns and they kind of had a certain routine. But then they all went out in all these different directions and did all these different careers and we're all over the place. So how do you weave those stories together? So I picked certain common areas. And as I said, I when I got confused or stalled, I tried to go back to, okay, what was this person doing that was related to landscape or land or place or region, right? Like even in the novels I study, they tend to be dealing with the landscape or their, you know, their parents' success or failure, you know. Um, some of the scientists I study were, you know, breeding um, seeds or collecting plants. And so it all, you know, so I tried to keep it that way and then picked, you know, several themes where I thought I could talk about the adults in several different chapters. So there's a little bit different rhythm, I think, from the first to the second half. But that's because they spun out in all these different directions, right? So that's a long answer to your question, um, Sarah. Thank you but for I, that. I, I, appreciate, I, I appreciate it. I like how often we get to talk about growing up or, or grown in this in this uh, in this launch so far. It's it's good. <laughs> yeah, you see how I got the title. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, maybe uh, I'll uh, so I'll, I'll reiterate, um, you know, welcoming audience questions at this time, but maybe I'll also invite Sheila um, to ask another question um, if there's one at the ready yeah roy i don't know if you have a follow-up can i ask my funny map question i uh, guess right. I'm, i don't know if i'm ready for it but yeah okay so that map and you you had it on the screen earlier so my question is um the reservations on the u.s side of the line are, are oh. correct in terms of size and shape uh -huh. the reserves on the canadian side of the line are all these beautiful little identical squares not reflecting the actual shape and I'm sort of curious what the thing, like, I, I have a suspicion I may know perhaps what the answer is, but it's a cartographical decision in this map. Can you comment on why that difference is there? Um, yeah, because it's more like representational, right? You're saying, you know, they're just 
a little square where there's yeah. a reserve. Yeah. I think yeah. it has to do with scale. I mean, I think it's a basic issue of scale, right? Mm -hmm. The way, and I think this isn't really well known, at least on the U.S. side of things, how um, how how reserves were made in Canada versus reservations in the U.S. Mm -hmm much larger territories that get kind of whittled down, whereas you had the treaty system that then individual bands and leaders chose smaller um, smaller mm -hmm. uh, pieces of land. And I think because there's so many of the smaller ones in Canada that it would, the scale you would need on a map to show their true shape and size was prohibitive like mm -hmm. it's one of those interesting things where comparing the u.s and canada is actually really different and perhaps i should have insisted on a much bigger map or a blow up of alberta because yeah. there are a certain there are a few places that are more important to my book than others reserves that i actually talk about mm -hmm. so i could have done that i don't know what your answer was does that does that mean i mean that that was my hunch as well there are so many more there are simply so many more reserves north of the line right um and uh, the only reason what caught my eye of course is you know i go to so i live right next to the Kanai reserve which is the biggest one in canada um and on here it's like it's the same size as one of the smallest ones in like northern saskatchewan um but i assumed that there was just there's a sheer technical difficulty um, yeah, because the Canadian there are so many more on the Canadian side of the line, and they vary from much much smaller chunks to bigger ones like the one I happen to live um, right next door to. So I just wanted to uh, I wanted to explore that question a little bit. So thank you for that. Well, no, that's a that's an interesting you know question. And of course, I worked with a cartographer that you know I liked, and I sort of went with her suggestions. But I sent her all these base maps of each province, and you know. The, <laughs> US and the States ones, but it was, um, and I really wanted to include that map too. I felt like that map was important yeah. to show yeah. indigenous people still here mm -hmm. and there, the diversity of um, the way that, you know, to hint at or to get at, which I do explain, I think in chapter one, how Canadians came up with their reserve processes versus the United States, I think. Um, working off at of Jill St. Germain, right? Yeah, yeah, Her work, yeah. Which I think yeah. is important because I don't think a lot of uh, historians on the U.S. side of the line appreciate that, mm -hmm. you know, those differences. So uh, yeah. somehow that was an important map to me. So it's interesting that it's you a have great that map. Map. <laughs> <laughs> maps, anyway. maps were important to me. I like to use maps. I like to have maps. Um, different. I kinds. agree completely. Thank you. And we do have um, two audience questions um, that have come up here. So I'll begin with um, Liz says, within the biographies, were there cases where expressed views towards the land varied depending on the audience they expected for their work, diary versus book, et cetera? Oh, that's a good question. Thanks, Liz. Um, uh, I don't know that I saw um, a, a huge difference between the thing about a book or a novel, obviously they're painting it into a narrative that they're creating. And so the land that they knew is, I mean, they're spending time on portraying it. And I think in the case of the authors I study, they actually, you know, that's part of their project. They want to present the grasslands in literature. And even though they're building a story around it, you know, which they need to do, they really do want to, to you know, record it in, in detail. Um, so I think that attaching to the story is a much bigger consideration in that case. When I had diaries, I mean, they seem to be more, you know, how farm people keep diaries and, you know, the entry and the weather. And then once in a while, um, Elsie Hammond would include a few more details. Um, so I didn't notice a huge difference. Um, and I don't know that I have like a case where I've got a bunch of diaries and then the, no the person wrote a novel to actually kind of tease that out. But thanks for that question, Liz. 
And then there's a question um, from Robert Coots. Molly, you may have touched on this, but do you think that early heritage commemoration and marking was critical to the idea of settler society as normative and part of the land and the landscape? Yeah, I do think, I don't know if I have talked about it, but I do touch on that. There's a period where, you know, just like setting up these archives, they would they would use landmarks, you know, historic markers. I know in Maple Creek, they did that. And even setting aside parks and all of these things, I think it was a part of the settler colonial process of claiming land. They were just claiming it differently, right? Claiming it through different cultural ways. I think that one of the interesting things about that, I didn't say a lot about it is, I think sometimes in those places where parks were set aside, I think probably settlers had no idea the benefit that indigenous people is, you know, how they were accessing those parks and what they were thinking of them and weren't aware how they were probably still being used as a sense of place and that part of indigenous culture, you know, and they, they weren't aware of it. Um, but I do think it's a part of the settler colonial process, the, the landmarks. I mean, obviously it's like marking is our, it's our heritage, it's our story. Right. Good question. Thank you for that. And maybe we'll end. Um, maybe if Roy has another uh, a shorter question to to sort of close out the the evening. Okay, a, a short big question, Molly. Uh, so you are writing neither from a U.S. perspective or a Canadian perspective. This is an amazing achievement that you've been able to work both sides of the boundary. I wonder whether you're worried though that you're gonna fall into this sort of nether world where we all laud transnational histories, but we are in fact ultimately sort of bound uh, within our own imaginations, within our na nation states histories. Uh, wait, say that last part again. Well, we're uh, Great Plains, uh, you know, our history, our history conferences, the Canadians go to a Canadian session, the Americans go to the American session, and there are actually relatively few transnational uh, sessions that we have at our conferences, right? And Right, that, no, definitely. And so we speak in high sort of glowing terms of how wonderful it is to do transnational history, but I'm wondering whether we, whether you worry that you might fall into kind of like neither this and neither that. Um, yeah, sometimes I do. And I still, it's, 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 it's a lot, it's a huge challenge to try to deal with both. And I think other transnational, you know, this, it's a huge challenge to deal with the laws and the peoples of different countries, because there are differences. And in this case, I mean, I picked something that I think encourages a sameness, right? As a, a linkage. If you yeah. asked a different question, you know, the, the national differences would show up. But, you know, I, I do worry and I do encourage. And I, I mean, Mark, part of the reason why I, I, I admire both of your works is you, you two are continually going across the national boundaries and, and pushing those questions. And, you know, we probably need to have more conferences and more transnational uh, panels. And we need more Prairie, Prairie West conferences and more exchange on the Northern Great Plains and the Prairie, you know, I try to go to those conferences, but um, it's, you know, it's a danger. It's a danger. And I think for those of us who studied this kind of Northern transnationalism, you know, there's a long history of getting bogged down in, in trying to bring these projects out either and, and there's the temptation maybe to, oh, I'll just go back to my side of the border. <laughs> you know, I, yeah. I do have ideas for, for other, other things I might do, particularly like on the 30s. It, I think there's a lot of work that could be done for transnational and compare and actual comparative policy studies. Yeah. Um, but um, it was a joy though to do. I mean, I've actually yeah. loved yeah, yeah. And the book, is, the book is chock full of insights because of the comparative analysis, I think. I mean, I learned so much by through that, through that kind of idea of comparative I mean, history. It had its own reward, Thank really. Yeah, no, no. And it's an amazing achievement, you know, if you're driving from Saskatchewan, Manitoba, North Dakota, South Dakota, those are long miles. <laughs> well, well, I'm a Plains person, right? So I love getting in the car and driving and, you know, no place is more beautiful than Saskatchewan and, you know, uh, in, in my world. And, uh, you know, just getting out, driving across those miles helps you think about things, right? Think through them. Um, you guys probably 
probably know that too, but it's a, it's a, you know, nice to get out there. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> well, thank you uh, so much uh, to, to the three of you, Molly, Sheila, and Roy. Um, thank you to everyone who's here for coming to the launch of Grasslands Grown, creating place on the U.S. Northern Plains and Canadian prairies. Um, you can purchase the print and ebook versions from the University of Manitoba Press website. I will once again put the link in the chat for the promo code um, so that you can get 30% off. A real treat. Um, yes, thank you. <laughs> and, uh, and yes, thank you. Thank you again um, for everyone for coming and for this really insightful, um, fascinating conversation. Thank you for organizing this, Sarah. Congratulations again, thank Molly. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, thank you, guys. Bye. Bye.